For more than half a century, dolphins and whales, known as cetaceans, have entertained us with their size, their intelligence, their beguiling smile, and their playful antics. Yet behind that built-in smile lies a dark side of captivity few know anything about. The volatile controversy of taking these fascinating social animals from their families in the wild to a tiny concrete tank in the name of public education. Public education here at Seoul is phenomenal. The people that walk out of our park have a better understanding, better appreciation of the animal. The awareness level is just heightened. Brad Andrews is Chief Zoological Officer for SeaWorld Parks and Entertainment. It's hard to compare. If you look back 20 years ago and where people thought about dolphins, if they couldn't have this exposure, dolphins would still be in shot out in the wild. Because 20 years ago they were. They were a menace. No one really cared about them. Nobody understood them. Nobody knew them. But now they do. This show is nothing more than a display of dominance. It teaches us that dominance is good, dominance is right, dominance works. Rick O'Berry was the trainer for the Flipper television show. For the past 40 years, he has dedicated himself to returning captive dolphins to the wild. And so the show only serves to perpetuate our insidious utilitarian perception of nature. It is, in fact, a form of bad education. And that's what this issue is all about. It's not just about the 1,000 dolphins in captivity. It's as much about the hundreds of millions of people who go through there and are miseducated, who come out of there thinking they belong here. I think there probably was emphasis on the past tense, a real educational value in the 50s and the 60s maybe into the early 70s. Dr. John Hall was a marine mammal biologist for SeaWorld. He left that position in the early 90s. Because a lot of Americans weren't aware of the uniqueness and the capabilities and the lifestyle of these marine mammals, and that one relatively inexpensive way for them to learn about them was to go to marine parks that held these animals in captivity. But I think that function has passed. And I think that, that basically we're seeing nothing new on the educational horizon that we didn't already know in the early 70s. And that the educational value today is dramatically reduced if it's present at all. Our increased understanding and ability to conduct non-invasive research in the wild is far more educational than anything that can be gathered today in an oceanarium environment, especially an oceanarium that holds marine mammals. When you look at the social life of dolphins and whales, it is difficult to underestimate the fact that their social life is everything to them. There is no such thing as a happy, solitary dolphin. Their lives, their selves, are meant to be defined in relation to their complex social group in relation to others, who their friends are, who their family is, who their kids are, even who their enemies are. They just cannot be dolphins and whales without other dolphins and whales. And these are very stable, long-term societies. On the coast of British Columbia here, these societies have gone back 10,000 years or more. Dr. Paul Spong has spent the past 30 years researching wild killer whales that have roamed the coastal waters off Washington State and British Columbia as far back as the Ice Age. They're, as far as I can tell, very conscious animals. They're very deliberate in the way in which they move, the way in which they relate to one another. And they're successful. 
you know, they're successful over the long term. Spong began his career as a researcher at the Vancouver Public Aquarium, where he learned firsthand the unique qualities of the animals many now call orcas, qualities that convinced him they belong only in the wild. I had a, a whale named Scanner involved in a very long, repetitive series of experiments. And then finally, from one trial to another, the whale reversed its behavior, went from 100% correct on a task to 0% correct, and it stayed there. And it, for the first time, made me think about what that animal was. People say, well, they're big brain intelligent animals. Well, they have to stop and talk. Well, is that a neurosurgeon talking? Is that somebody that does brain anatomy work? Or is that somebody that truly wants to, again, make a mystique of the animal? They're no more intelligent than my dog. When you stop and talk about people that study cetacean anatomy, they tell you that the, the wiring isn't the same as in a human. I've studied dolphin and whale brains for close to 20 years. I've studied their brains, I've studied their behavior, their cognitive abilities, and I can tell you that the, the idea that dolphins and whales are no more intelligent than dogs is simply indefensible. The fact is, is that their brains are much larger in relative size and more convoluted than most animals except modern humans. And their capacities are extremely rare in the animal kingdom. And as smart as dogs and cats and other animals are, and I don't want to put dogs down, but the fact of the matter is when it comes to dolphins and whales, we're talking about a very rare, complex intelligence that I don't think is, is matched uh, in the rest of the animal kingdom with the exception of humans and possibly elephants and other primates. Senior scientist for Humane Society International, Dr. Naomi Rose, is one of the foremost experts on the natural history of wild orcas and their complex societies. Orcas are probably the most socially bonded mammals on the planet, in some ways even more so than human beings. The offspring of a female, the matrium, stay with her for their whole life. Daughters will eventually move away at some distance to raise their own families, but the sons stay with their mothers for a lifetime. They'll leave her briefly for a few days, possibly a couple of weeks, to mate with unrelated females, but they'll always return to the mother at the end of all that. So historically, when a researcher saw a female or a group of females with, with a large male in, in, in the group, they assumed that it was a harem bull with all of his uh, harem females. But in fact, he was the oldest son of one of the females in that group, or the brother or the uncle of one of the females in the, that group. It's really a remarkable social system that is, in fact, very rare in the animal kingdom. Nearly every facility that keeps dolphins or whales has been directly or indirectly involved in capturing them from the wild. It's difficult to understand the trauma involved, both to the individual dolphin or whale taken and to its extended family, without seeing firsthand just how these captures are conducted. The mainstays of nearly every captive facility are the bottlenose dolphins. Bottlenose societies are made up of family units called pods, which center on the mothers, their newborn, and other females. Gregarious by nature, pods of bottlenose frequent shallow waters and estuaries throughout temperate and tropical waters, including those of Florida and Mississippi, which make them far easier to catch than other species. For the better part of 30 years, veterinarian Jay Sweeney has made his living capturing and selling dolphins to marine parks all over the world. And although no capture permits have been issued in the U.S. waters for the past two decades, captures are still legal here, and this video of Sweeney and his crew capturing bottlenose dolphins in Florida waters in the 1980s is a graphic example of those individuals, including Sweeney, still involved in this business. Once the dolphins were spotted in the shallows, the mother boat chased the pod to slow it down, while the second boat circled them, deploying a net that closes off at the bottom. 
It's a very violent procedure to capture a dolphin. That's the dirty little secret in the industry. And I've captured scores of dolphins. I can tell you firsthand, it's a very violent procedure. The netted dolphins wrapped in the webbing were wrestled into submission. The crew then lifted them to the deck of the capture boat. Those that were released had no follow-up to assure that they survived the trauma. Where less than an hour ago these animals swam freely in the open ocean estuaries, from this moment forward, they will never see the ocean or their family again. The situation for killer whales is a little different and has for decades involved to a great extent the largest, wealthiest, and most politically powerful of all marine parks, SeaWorld Parks and Entertainment. Former Washington Secretary of State Ralph Monroe witnessed a killer whale capture at Bud Inlet in March of 1976. It was really quite by accident. Uh, several of us were out sailing uh, one day and we uh, came across a whale capture, and we weren't really sure what it was at first. We saw this huge flotilla of, of uh, boats and so forth coming towards us, chasing these whales down into southern Puget Sound, using explosive devices dropped from the airplane and uh, all kinds of tactics that weren't allowed in the permit that they'd been given. Uh, we watched as the whales made a run for it. Uh, by that time, uh, the captors uh, had netted off a big enough portion of this inlet that they were able to get them inside the purse seine. There was no question that there were uh, mothers inside the net with babies outside. And, and uh, it appeared to me that uh, the captor uh, stood there and lit these underwater explosive devices as fast as he could light them. It sounded like a war. There was just explosion after explosion after explosion. It was one of the most gruesome things I've ever seen. Uh, consequently, we went to court and we really started to dig into who was behind all this. We found it was SeaWorld behind it. We reached settlement uh, only after testimony began to come in about previous captures where lots of whales had died. SeaWorld's history of capturing killer whales is lengthy and highly controversial. In a similar set, six years earlier, Don Goldsberry and Ted Griffin caught 80 killer whales at Penn Cove, Washington, taking seven for various parks. Several months after these captures, four dead whales, including three calves, washed ashore, their bodies slid open and weighed down with steel chains. After months of denial, Goldsberry admitted that the whales had died during the Penn Cove capture and that he and his crew had towed their bodies into the sound and sunk them in the dead of night. Maybe we made a mistake, or the animals made a mistake, or it was just one of those things, in which I don't like to admit. I don't think anyone does. I, it, uh, we don't go out there deliberately to kill animals, and uh, it does happen on occasion. I don't care what kind of animal you're after, there's occasions <coughs> where the animal will be killed. SeaWorld pressed for an out-of-court settlement, granted only after they reluctantly agreed to end all captures from Washington state waters. Yet Don Goldsberry, the person most responsible for the death of at least four killer whales and multiple permit violations, became vice president of animal collections for SeaWorld. In fact, in the 60s and 70s, most of the animals taken were from the southern resident community. I think there were more than 40 individuals removed from this community. And they represented an age class of younger animals primarily. And in fact, I think pretty much a whole generation of these animals was lost to the population. 
And as a result of that, there was a real reduction in the rate of growth of the population afterwards. And it's only been in the last few years that there's been a, a, a beginning of an increase in that population. So it really did have a drastic effect on that population. In fact, the southern resident population is yet to recover and was listed as endangered in 2005 under the U.S. Endangered Species Act, in large part due to the removal of this entire generation of whales. Facilities with captive whales and dolphins can be found in over 40 countries around the world. Most foreign facilities are inadequate by U.S. standards. However, many problems at places like SeaWorld, the Shedd Aquarium, or Six Flags Discovery Kingdom, formerly Marine World Africa USA, are inherent to the captivity business worldwide. Right around that, right around the outside, I know. On the shores of Lake Michigan sits Chicago's John G. Shedd Aquarium. In 1991, the Shedd completed the construction of an oceanarium that was to feature Pacific white-sided dolphins and beluga whales. The Shedd's initiation into the captive dolphin industry was anything but uneventful. In 1988, Jay Sweeney was hired by the Shedd to capture eight Pacific white-sided dolphins from California waters. Of the eight that were captured, three were released and one died, and the Shedd had its first four dolphins. But that was just the beginning. In 1989, the aquarium captured two beluga whales from Canadian waters, and by August of 1992, were after four more. Unlike their first captures, however, video was taken this time by Canadian television, and the public got its first glimpse of just how these captures are conducted. High-speed boats are used to chase down and separate whales from the herd, then drive them in panic to the shallows. The capture team then jumps on the backs of the whales, wrestling them and tying them up to prevent their escape. They are then loaded into small boats for the long haul to shore, where they're carried in slings. to a tiny holding tank. And tossed in. Thank you, Backed by a supportive Chicago media, the shed was able to effectively stave off public protest. Ken Ramirez, Shed's Vice President of Animal Collections and Training, attempted to shift the attention to the aquarium's positive contributions. And we're going to continually be called in to work on rescuing animals that are stranded, to try to evaluate why beluga whales in the St. Lawrence River are, are quickly dying off. If we don't understand anything about their, about their physiology, about their natural behavior, about the, the types of ways their, their, their internal structure works, how are we ever going to make sure these animals have a home to live in and they're going to survive? Yet, shortly after these captures, a graphic example of Shedd's real concern for wild belugas was uncovered. The beluga whale population of the St. Lawrence Seaway is down to a fraction of what it was just three decades ago. Here, belugas have been dying from something they can neither see nor comprehend, chemical pollution. Every year, dead belugas wash to shore, their bodies riddled with chemicals like Myrax, PCB, and BAP. These belugas are so polluted, they nearly meet the U.S. Superfund criteria as toxic waste. In the late 1990s, the Canadian government named the 50 worst polluters of the St. Lawrence Seaway, and prominent on that list was Monsanto. 
a company in which the Shedd Aquarium was heavily invested, as revealed by their 1992 tax forms. The aquarium's investment in this major polluter of beluga habitat totaled nearly half a million dollars. To compound matters, Shedd had on its board of trustees the vice president and general counsel of chemical waste management, which, according to the Chicago Tribune, has amassed a long history of record-breaking fines for illegal chemical dumping. And so, while the Shedd Aquarium claimed to care about beluga whales and the problems they faced in the wild, it has had business relationships with known environmental polluters, including at least one company responsible for contributing to the pollution of the beluga habitat itself, the St. Lawrence Seaway. As if this were not enough, when the beluga captures were broadcast on Canadian television, public outrage was so powerful that in 1992, the Canadian government ended all further beluga captures from their waters. Today, belugas, like those currently on display at Marineland Niagara Falls, are taken from Russian waters, with virtually no regulation on how the captures are conducted. Unfortunately, this brand of preservation can be found over and over again in the annals of the marine park and aquarium business. In 1993, Marine World Africa USA in Vallejo, California, since bought by Six Flags and renamed Discovery Kingdom, sought to acquire four false killer whales on their federal permit. But the statutes for capturing dolphins in U.S. waters requires lengthy, expensive studies to ensure their removals will not harm local populations. None had been done for false killer whales in U.S. waters, so Marine World looked elsewhere. In news of nature and the environment, You've probably seen those dolphin safe labels on canned tuna to indicate no dolphins were hurt or killed in the tuna nets. What you may not know is the netting of dolphins overseas, especially in Asia, for sale to theme parks can and does result in dolphin deaths, and it's no accident. In 1978, I was filming spinner dolphins in Hawaii when someone came running up to me and showed me this aerial photograph of a beach full of dead dolphins. It was a place called Iki, Japan, and I um, had never, of course, heard of that. Um, but I vowed pretty much on the spot that I would go there and I would do everything I possibly could to, to stop the slaughter of those dolphins. Little did I know what I was getting into because I was 1978 and more than 30 years later I'm still going back to Japan trying to stop the slaughter. The Japanese say that uh, the hunt of dolphins is cultural, but the real reason that they do it is for money. The dolphin hunters make a good deal of money off of killing dolphins and selling dolphins to aquaria. After we shot the footage in 1980, the whole world revolted against the uh, killing of these dolphins. And the prefecture, uh, Nagasaki prefecture, where Iki is located, uh, said, Let, you know, no more dolphin killing. The publicity is just too, too bad. And so the killing did stop. But uh, what happened was that aquarium interests came in and they went to the fishermen and said, you know, get us some dolphins, can you? What happened was that there were four or five hundred dolphins rounded up and, and run into the bay and maybe 40 or 50 of them were taken into captivity and the rest were slaughtered. Starting in the early 80s, SeaWorld which had developed a business relationship and a professional relationship with the Kamigawa Sea World in Japan, had learned that it might be possible to enter into a business arrangement with the Iki Island fishermen, who had largely phased out the dry fishery because of the negative worldwide publicity in the late 70s, to start selectively driving dolphins, including false killer whales, into shallow water where SeaWorld and other ocean area, including Marine World, could select the beautiful few 
the highly cosmetic animals that didn't have the nicks and abrasions that wouldn't look good in public, and then allow the fishermen to slaughter the remaining dolphins and false killer whales. The rejects. SeaWorld and other ocean area, including Marine World, continued to underwrite this dry fishery in order to obtain false killer whales. And it was only when Marine World apparently got some wires crossed in terms of information leakage that the whole thing became uh, quite well known to the public. By the time I moved to San Diego as research scientist, SeaWorld had uh, several false killer whales in captivity that had been obtained through this dry fishery that they stimulated. When we drive dolphins in, we sell them to aquariums. The price is 300,000 yen for bottlenose dolphins and 450,000 yen for false killer whales. Not all dolphins caught can be sold or are proper for aquarium use. Those that don't go to the parks are killed and the meat is sold. <laughs> Well, the fishermen would not stop the dry fishery. There would be no way to get dolphins to the aquariums. And also the price of the dolphins would be much higher. The money from the aquariums is one of the reasons that the fishermen continue the dry fishery. This undercover video shows false killer whales captured in a Japanese drive fishery and destined for marine parks. The fishermen themselves were reimbursed only for their time and fuel whereas most of the profits went to places like the Tokyo-based Delfino Corporation that brokered the animals, and Jay Sweeney, who was often contracted by facilities like Marine World to pack and move them. In the late 80s, Sweeney was asked about his involvement. I don't work with Japanese fishermen, fishermen at all. I don't even know who they are. I was having dinner in Hawaii with a veterinarian who specializes in capturing dolphins for aquariums. His name is Jay Sweeney. And I was uh, discussing with Sweeney the disease, uh, disease among dolphins, and this was just after the uh, die-off of dolphins had taken place along the east coast of the United States, and Sweeney, as a veterinarian, was um, um, he was imparting some information to me, but I was also just uh, sitting there at, at dinner and um, trying to get what, whatever information I could out of him. And I mentioned that I'd been to Taiji, and he said, uh, well, I'm going to Taiji in May, next May. So I said, okay. And then what happened is that I went myself to Taiji on the dates that Sweeney had told me he'd be there. And I showed up with my camera, just me and my little camera, and there was Sweeney taking dolphins out of the bay at uh, Taiji, out of the, the harbor. He was just begging me not to videotape and, and film him, but I, uh, I continued to do so. We can do, we can do things together. I can help you, you know, in the years to come. Yeah. And you can blow it right now. I'm just taking pictures of an event related to dolphins as I am, as I do all over the world. SeaWorld's effort to bring back the drive fishery was so successful that these Rissos dolphins were destined not to marine parks, but in this case, to the United States Navy. I have some videotape of you working with Japanese fishermen. Yes, but that is, the Japanese fishermen are, are um, responsible for removing the animals from the water. I am on the scene to oversee that that process does not harm the animals, but I don't work with them. You pay them? I don't pay them. My client pays a Japanese uh, agent who, who pays them. The conservation community challenged Marine World's import permit under regulations of the United States Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972 which requires documentation that the captures were humanely conducted. Marine World could provide no such documentation. And in the summer of 1993, the U.S. National Marine Fisheries Service withdrew Marine World's permit to import these animals from Japan. Prior to this ruling, however, other facilities like Hawaii's Sea Life Park, the Indianapolis Zoo, Miami Seaquarium, 
C. arama in Texas, Gulfarium in Florida, and the Shedd Aquarium had either imported animals from Japan or had permits naming Japan as the collection point. Foreign facilities in Japan, Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore, and Hong Kong were involved as well, and these facilities, as well as those in China, Turkey, French Polynesia, Palau, South Korea, Taiwan, and the Dominican Republic, continue to seek or acquire animals through the drive fishery. Securing dolphins and false killer whales from Japan's drive fisheries was only one of the methods originated by SeaWorld to assure not only a steady supply of these smaller animals, but the larger killer whales as well. Dr. John Hall. SeaWorld obtained permits from the fishery service to import six false killer whales in the late 1980s. They sent a capture team to Iki Island and they caught 12 killer, false killer whales. Numbers seven through 12 were trucked on a flatbed truck over rough roads from Iki Island all the way to Kamigawa SeaWorld on the east coast of Japan, north of Tokyo. SeaWorld employees then were involved directly in the transport of those six false killer whales. They trucked them to Tokyo, put them on a jet freighter, and flew them from Tokyo to Hong Kong to Singapore to Dubai in the Arab Emirates, and then from the Arab Emirates to Amsterdam. They were then trucked to the Dolphinarium in Holland at Hardewijk, and they were used as trading material. They put those animals through immense stress in order to avoid Canadian airspace and possible inspection, knowing that they didn't have permits for them. They traded those six false killer whales that they collected in Japan for the killer whale named Gudrun. Gudrun was officially listed on the U.S. federal importation permit as a breeding loner to SeaWorld. Historically, U.S. capture permits for dolphins or whales required government scrutiny and public input. For SeaWorld, this meant high visibility and controversy. Yet if they bought killer whales from other facilities or borrowed them for breeding purposes, they could bring them into the U.S. with little fanfare and less regulation. But that was only half the story. Ken Balcom has been studying the killer whales of Puget Sound, Washington for the past 40 years. After the movie Free Willy was shot, Balcom was originally asked to put together a detailed plan for bringing the star of the movie, Keiko, into the United States from his tank in Mexico City. He set out to learn as much about Keiko as he could. We found that uh, there were three conflicting stories on the origin of Keiko. So we went to Iceland and we talked to Johan Sigur Jansson, who's the biologist for the fisheries department of Iceland. Well, the response to blow me clear out of my chair was, maybe he's one of the hidden whales. And the hidden whale was what? I asked him, what's a hidden whale? Well, you know as well as I do, Ken, uh, there are some animals that some people doesn't want anybody to know about. And that was all he'd say. After SeaWorld agreed not to collect killer whales from Washington state waters, they needed a reliable source of killer whales to replenish and fill their new parks. And so they set up an operation in Iceland whereby an advanced team would obtain permits from the Icelandic government to collect live killer whales for export. But because SeaWorld had no U.S. permits for direct importation, they would then fly the killer whales to the Dolphinarium in Holland or to the uh, Canadian Oceanarium at Niagara Falls, and they would stash the whales for months or, in some cases, years while back in the U.S., SeaWorld would then approach the National Marine Fishery Service and apply for permits to import already captured animals for their breeding program, indicating that the source of the original collections may well be unknown to anyone. According to Hall, 
SeaWorld officials caught whale after whale in Iceland, shipping them from Reykjavik to marine parks in Holland, the United Kingdom, France, and Canada. And from 1976 to 1978, at least nine whales were sent directly from Iceland to SeaWorld in the United States. In October of 1987, SeaWorld was back with Don Goldsberry, Brad Andrews, and Jim Antrim, SeaWorld's then vice president and general curator, operating on an Icelandic herring saner called the Gudrun. After the three men were photographed by the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, SeaWorld ordered them to leave Iceland immediately, stating that they had only been there to conduct killer whale surveys, even though an exhaustive survey had just been completed, and a holding tank in Reykjavik was filled with water and ready for whales. In the early 80s, Goldsberry built another holding tank with SeaWorld's money in the tiny town of Sædisfjordur, where the Icelandic killer whales were shipped not only to Europe and Canada, but to South America and Japanese parks as well. According to Goldsberry, these shipments were taking place even without the knowledge of the Icelandic government. SeaWorld's ability to skirt easily around the intent of animal importation laws led to other foreign captures of killer whales and shipments into the United States. It also led to death sentences for others. Junior was a male killer whale. In 1990, Friends of the Dolphins shot this undercover video of Junior and his temporary company of two bottlenose dolphins. He and two other killer whales were caught in Iceland and flown to marine land of Ontario. Long after his herd mates were sent to SeaWorld, Junior remained isolated in a tiny tank inside a damp warehouse next to the park. Shy and passive by nature, he was picked on relentlessly by the other whales, so no other facility wanted him. Month after month, year after year, Junior remained warehoused, virtually ignored by park officials, while the park's other whales at least had companionship and physical activity. In April of 1994, after four years of isolation, Friends of the Dolphins again shot undercover video of Junior. Barely an adolescent at about 12 years of age, he was alone, lethargic, his spirit broken. It's clear, people are hiding stuff. I mean, they were hiding Junior, the other poor whale that was caught when, 89 or something? Ended up in Marineland, Ontario, and for five years was kept in a warehouse in a kiddie pool? and he died. He was never on any record. They reported from Marineland, Ontario to National Marine Fisheries, the whales that they had in their inventory, and he wasn't there. He's a hidden whale, he's another one, but he's dead. By this time, the value of killer whales and their smaller cousins to the captive display industry had escalated. The Japanese drive fishery for dolphins would now include just about any cetacean unlucky enough to swim near their shores, including killer whales. The most recent capture of killer whales um, took place when 10 killer whales were unfortunate enough to get near to Taiji and they were all driven into that same hideous bay that uh, is used for the slaughter of so many dolphins. The Japanese hunted killer whales directly as whales for whale meat for many, many years and essentially annihilated them over the, co over the course of decades. So it was a bit of a surprise when 10 killer whales were found rather close to Taiji because so many had been just wiped out in previous years. Of the 10, five were taken into captivity, the young females and uh, the juveniles, and five were released because they, these were males and they didn't have any use for them. So that pod of ten killer whales was essentially wiped out in that, in that event. They, they, even the ones who, who left had no ability to reproduce.
In the United States, whales and dolphins are protected by the Animal Welfare Act or the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972, the MMPA. Included in the MMPA were specific regulations for capturing and maintaining marine mammals. Most of the jurisdiction rested with the National Marine Fisheries Service, often referred to as NIMFS. In 1994, the Alliance of Marine Mammal Parks and Aquariums, whose premier member is SeaWorld, lobbied Congress to have all regulations of these captive animals transferred to the underfunded and understaffed APHIS, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The efforts of the Alliance paid off. After nearly a quarter century of regulating the marine mammal display industry, NIMFS was stripped of almost all jurisdiction by Congress. There's already a federal law, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and a federal law, the Animal Welfare Act, where the U.S. Department of Agriculture inspects facilities. Uh, there's plenty of laws already. In fact, marine mammals are one of the most highly regulated animals in the animal kingdom. Um, the laws are adequate, and uh, the federal laws take care of everything very well. With enforcement now in the hands of APHIS, activists feared the fate of captive marine mammals would only get worse. Under NIMFS, attempts were made to keep track of all captive marine mammals through marine mammal inventory reports, an annual status of every animal held by each park or aquarium, including foreign parks that bought animals from U.S. facilities. But these inventory reports were not without their own problems. According to this report, a dolphin gave birth to a calf 13 days after it died, while a male transferred from California became a female when he arrived in Florida. Old dolphins moved to other facilities, became younger. 26 disappeared from existence, and 92 dolphins had no recorded origins. Worse, foreign parks purchasing U.S. dolphins often lied to nymphs, housing the dolphins in substandard conditions and refusing to provide the service with inventory reports. In the early 90s, at Marineland of Ontario, it was reported that at least 80% of their bottlenose dolphins had died. The exact numbers are unknown, for although they were required to provide inventory reports on marine mammals to the National Marine Fisheries Service, until 1994, none had been forthcoming. This amateur video shows a dolphin performance at Conneland in Switzerland, which provided tank dimension and water quality reports that were all within U.S. standards. Yet, Conneland officials omitted the fact that the underwater window doubled as a wall in an all-night discotheque, eliminating any extended rest period for the dolphins. This inventory system was one of the few procedures maintained by nymphs, and it remains as flawed as ever. Almost all other jurisdiction fell to APHIS, which resulted in even less regulation of the industry. For example, Prior to the Act's amendments, dolphin swim programs became a new phenomenon where owners were charging up to $100 per person for a half-hour swim with dolphins. Nymphs considered these programs experimental, initially allowing only four to operate while attempting to determine their safety. The new amendments, on the other hand, paved the way for immediate, uncontrolled expansion. Dolphin shows and swim programs, like those set up by Jay Sweeney at the Waikaloa Hotel in Hawaii, can now appear in shopping centers, amusement parks, technically even gas stations, and there is little that can be done to stop it. What's wrong with having a couple of dolphins in a swim program at, say, the Waikaloa Hotel in Hawaii or uh, in uh, the Bahama Islands or a Las Vegas casino? There's millions of them out there. What's wrong with having a few here? People here would never see them if we weren't doing this. That's the question. And the answer is, it's abusive. Well, these very same people are never going to see a snow leopard. Should we go drag some snow leopards out of the Himalayas for them as well? I think if you want to see Grand Canyon, you have to go see Grand Canyon. That's how it works. That's how it should work with these dolphins and whales. And if you can't do that, you may have to hum a few bars of you can't always get what you want and move on with your life. No one has ever seen a dinosaur or petted one or fed one, um, and yet they are beloved. And if you ask a, an eight-year-old boy or girl anything about dinosaurs, they will rattle off all the facts. They know everything. 
And so they're not suffering from never having actually seen a dinosaur. And they won't suffer from never actually seeing these large animals in captivity. In fact, I think that you can make an argument that what seeing an animal like that in captivity tells a child is something that is anti-conservation. That, look, we can control these animals. We can take them out of their natural environment. You don't have to care about their counterparts in the wild. We've got them right here in captivity for you to see and to feed and to touch. So don't worry about it. They'll always be there. With enforcement of the dolphin swim programs now in the hands of APHIS, the situation has gotten far worse than before. Right now in the U.S. there are no regulations that even govern how they should be run. They are dangerous to the animals. They are dangerous to people. They put an enormous amount of stress on the animals, and people have been injured in these programs. But stress is not the only problem the swim program dolphins face. Dr. John Hall. There's a relatively short window of their overall life between the age of about two and the age of about seven when they may, depending on their personality, be suitable for swim with programs. Once both males and females reach sexual maturity, these animals then become very aggressive with the human swimmers. If they have a lifespan of 35 or 40 years and they're seven or eight years old when they're too old to actively participate in a swim with program safely, what do you do with them for the next 30 or 35 years? Prior to the transfer of jurisdiction from nymphs to APHIS, facilities were required to file reports of injuries to people by aggressive dolphins in these swim programs. From 1989 to 1994, the last year of NIMPS jurisdiction, 18 injuries, mostly broken bones and lacerations, were reported. It took APHIS until the fall of 1998 to reestablish regulations for reporting those injuries. And yet, since the spring of 1999, only six months later, enforcement of these reports has been suspended, but the injuries continue to occur. To adapt to a life in the ocean, where the world becomes pitch black only a few hundred feet below the surface, dolphins have evolved a form of biosonar far more sophisticated than any device yet conceived by humans. And as their vision in and out of water is nearly as good as our own, it would be difficult to attribute the many injuries suffered by swim with participants as accidents or misjudgments on the part of the dolphins. Case in point. January 1st, 2008, at the Dolphin Academy on the Caribbean island of Curaçao, a single dolphin leaping over a bar suddenly turned sideways, crashing into three swim-with participants, one of them requiring hospitalization. It was reported that park officials unsuccessfully attempted to confiscate all photos and video, later denying it, and claiming the incident to be a miscalculation on the part of the dolphin. The ability of the Alliance of Marine Mammal Parks and Aquariums and other industry representatives to influence congressional action has virtually deregulated the display industry. Whales and dolphins, which before belonged to the American people in trust, are now for all intents and purposes the property of the parks themselves, to do with as they wish. To the paying public, life for captive dolphins and whales seems pleasant enough, almost luxurious by contrast to the harsh ocean environment, but the most revealing statistics deal with longevity, how long these animals live in captivity as compared to the wild, and these statistics are difficult to dispute. Much of the information related to longevity in U.S. parks and aquariums is provided not by the government, but by the parks and aquariums themselves. Yet, even this compromised data, coupled with independent monitoring over the years, give a clear picture of just how serious this problem is. Male killer whales, for example, have an estimated maximum life expectancy of 50 to 60 years in the wild. Females, 80 to 90 years. Of the 140 killer whales taken from the wild from marine parks and aquariums since the early 1960s, 90% are dead. Of those dead, none lived past their early 30s, and most died by their late teens or early 20s. The oldest living killer whales currently in captivity are two females in their mid-40s 
and although considered ancient by display industry standards, in the wild, they would be in the prime of their lives. But statistics on how long killer whales, for example, live in captivity as opposed to the wild are vehemently disputed by marine park officials. I think the objections start with the fact that um, when you have somebody just flashing figures out to prove a point and the figures are wrong and no one is around that does the good science or the good work to refute them, then it becomes a believable item. We, don't, we just don't make these things up. You know, we don't sit at SeaWorld and say, oh, well, they only live this long. I mean, this is done by the studies that we do, the studies that are going in the wild and the things that mesh. I mean, the males really and literally, according to the most current literature that's out, don't live past 30 and the females maybe 35, 40. If SeaWorld's claim that whales live 25 to 30 years is true, that's just an if it's true, then uh, not only is half the population we have now well past that, uh, they must be dead already, or they must be going to die in the next few moments. We're gonna have a catastrophic die off if what they say is true. And it's not happening. They're still having babies at age 40. While SeaWorld claims to educate the public on the lifespan of captive killer whales, they were the first to ignore the 1990 study from the International Whaling Commission, the IWC, where American and Canadian fisheries researchers concluded that based on studying nearly 250 juveniles and adults, survival of wild killer whales was significantly higher than in captivity. Years later, their colleague, Graham Ellis, wrote, there has been no change in the statistics since 1995. The IWC report also published results of a 14-year study citing an average lifespan for male killer whales at 30 years with a maximum lifespan estimated at between 40 to 60 years. The average lifespan for females was 50 years with a maximum estimated between 80 and 90 years. SeaWorld Enterprises claims to have the most sophisticated and modern captive killer whale facilities worldwide. Yet in spite of this claim, 25 of their whales have died in the past 25 years, ranging in age from a few months to 30 years, well below even their average lifespan. The last three, 20-year-old Taima, 12-year-old Sumar, and 25-year-old Kalina. And what about the quality of life for these animals? No matter how hard marine parks or aquariums try, they cannot meet in captivity the physical and mental requirements of these animals in the wild. We just don't have enough money to build facilities which are big enough to let these animals really roam as they would in the wild. And so we put them in noisy, artificially constrained environments and then ask them to perform the same show over and over and over. In my opinion, it's a recipe for disaster. Dolphins and whales do not belong in captivity. There is no possible way that one can provide for them in captivity. Their natural uh, behavior involves complex social interactions with large groups of animals. It involves traveling to different places with their companions. It involves developing cultural traditions and exploring, and all of that is taken away in captivity. Their entire social system is disrupted in captivity, putting strangers together and separating them and moving them to another park. All of that disruption creates patterns that are completely abnormal. These factors came to a head at SeaWorld San Diego on August 21, 1989, when an incident between two killer whales, Corky and Kandu, resulted in Kandu's death. Apparently, there had been some tension between these two females for a number of weeks and days preceding the incident, but the show must go on. In fact, at the very beginning of the show, so the audience was all watching, uh, the tension just broke, and Kandu rammed Corky, and the blow was so hard that she broke her jaw and she severed an artery, and she proceeded to bleed to death in about 45 minutes right in front of all of these people. They were from two different populations. Um, there was some tension there that would, was simply completely artificial. It never would have existed in the wild. 
All of the stress from an artificial environment has resulted in dozens of serious injuries to trainers as well. One of the worst occurring at SeaWorld San Diego on November 21st, 1987. In this amateur video, SeaWorld trainer John Sillick is seen riding on the back of a killer whale when a second whale jumps out of the water and lands directly on top of him. Sillick's injuries were massive, yet he lived through the incident. Others were not so fortunate. Loro Parquet is an amusement park located on the island of Tenerife, nearly 200 miles off the coast of Spain. In its facility, four killer whales perform in a small concrete tank, all of them loaned to the park from SeaWorld. On October 7, 2007, during a pre-show warm-up, one of the whales rammed a female trainer, injuring her right lung and breaking her forearm, then dragging her to the bottom of the tank, where she was finally rescued by two colleagues. By all rights, this should have served as a warning to park officials with regard to trainer interactions in the water with these whales. On February 20th, 2010, a second ramming incident cost trainer Alexis Martinez his life, as Quito, a 13-year-old male killer whale, rammed Martinez, breaking his rib cage and dragging him to the bottom of the tank. Martinez could not be revived. This is Tilikum. In 1992, Sealand in Victoria, Canada, isolated him in a tiny, cramped medical pool because his aggressive nature, perhaps the result of questionable training methods, threatened a newborn calf that he, in fact, had sired. This aggressiveness was already well established, having surfaced all too dramatically the previous February when 20-year-old part-time trainer Kelty Burns slipped and fell into the killer whale tank. Tillicum and his two tank mates grabbed Byrne and took her to the bottom of the pool where she drowned. And several hours later, the whales allowed the recovery of her body. In spite of Tillicum's aggressive nature, SeaWorld mounted a concerted effort to transfer him to their Orlando Park to become only the second male in their newly established breeding program. Tillicum was a ticking time bomb that went off on February 24, 2010. Moments after the killer whale show had ended, Tillicum grabbed Dawn Brenchow, one of SeaWorld's most experienced trainers, and pulled her into the tank. Witnesses testified that he shook her violently over and over as he repeatedly took her underwater. Branchow died on the scene, her broken and dismembered body literally shaken apart. This is a, an incredibly tragic story from a number of angles, right? Obviously, we all feel terrible for Dawn. She was a fine person, fine trainer, uh, dedicated. Uh, she cared for the animals and, uh, you know, how can you not grieve for her and her family? Tragic, terrible. The evidence uh, that is available suggests that there was some type of social unrest going on in, uh, in the group of whales prior to her being grabbed and taken down uh, and eventually being killed. Uh, but there's another side to this tragedy, and that is Tillicum's story. Tillicum's story is extremely sad and unfortunately very common in this industry where this animal, as a very young male, a small calf, was removed from his mother, captured in nets, plucked out of his natural environment. Taken to a holding facility in Canada, uh, after he participated in the death of the trainer in Canada, he was then loaded onto a aircraft and transported to uh, SeaWorld in Florida where now he is a very subdominant animal amongst uh, a group of established females. No place to run, uh, no place to hide, being chased. Perhaps speaks a, an entirely different language or dialect of the same language. Essentially is put into slave labor. And unfortunately this is an all too common theme, common storyline with the animals at SeaWorld. There were uh, trainers 
that discussed uh, the whole captivity issue uh, at great lengths. Um, as you can imagine, this was a very taboo subject and one that was uh, best kept among tight friends and people that you had confidence in that could keep this in your circle. Uh, this is not something that would have been dealt with uh, very nicely about uh, with the corporate PR machine. And the consensus was that this is an appalling thing we're doing. And at the same time, uh, the conclusion was, while it is appalling and while it is grotesque, at least the animals have the benefit of us caring trainers taking care of them at the end of the day. And, uh, and to leave because of those uh, feelings against captivity would mean that you also took the care that you provided away from them. So it was sort of a catch-22 for a, a, a lot of people. I question the mental health of a lot of these captive marine mammals. Uh, after all, cap captivity uh, changes them forever. Habitat dictates behavior. Uh, we never heard of a, an orca grabbing somebody, a person off the beach and pulling them underwater and drowning them like we have in captivity. This is bizarre. Uh, many people have been hurt by these animals and it's not their fault, it's what we're doing to them. In the wild, there has never been a single instance of an orca killing or seriously injuring a person. And that's not because people don't swim with them. People swim with them around the world. There are researchers who swim with them all the time. There's never been a single instance of aggression in wild orcas. So what that tells you is that the behavior that they're exhibiting in captivity is abnormal aggression. In a captive environment, this abnormal aggression appears to be anything but abnormal. Since 1968, four people have been killed by captive killer whales, and scores of injuries have been reported with at least 50 at SeaWorld facilities alone. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, because many injuries go unreported, especially those that occur outside of public view because of out-of-court settlements and non-disclosure agreements. The issue of keeping captive whales and dolphins is enormously complex. Anti-captivity forces argue that viable alternatives exist. Take a look at the Monterey Aquarium, for example. That's, that's proof that you can have a, a, an aquarium uh, and educate the public and still make a lot of money. It has the highest attendance of any aquarium in America, and they've made a conscious decision to be part of the solution. They don't have any live dolphins and whales. They have some very beautiful models, life-size. And when you go to SeaWorld in these places, the only thing that's correct anymore is the external anatomy. And you get that at the Monterey Aquarium. But while marine parks insist they are responsible for increased public awareness of these animals and the problems they face in the wild, they have an even greater incentive to remain unchanged. Dr. John Hall. At one point in time, um, a former vice president of public relations, uh, Jackie Hill, uh, while a guest at my house in uh, Alaska, told me that it was her understanding that, that SeaWorld considered that 70% of the total income to the parks was derived because they had killer whales in captivity, and that they considered maintaining killer whales in captivity and a reliable source of killer whales to replace those that died to be critical to the financial well-being of the parks. That may well have been part of the um, reason, the foundation for the rather remarkable financial success of SeaWorld and the SeaWorld Enterprise Parks in comparison to other marine parks that may not have had the financial resources and the political wherewithal to be able to conduct these laundering activities in Iceland in the manner and degree to which SeaWorld did. Given the attendance at all the SeaWorld parks combined is 9 or 10 million people a year, and that they're spending probably close to $70 a person, it, it would be ludicrous to think that SeaWorld Enterprises would give up this tremendous cash cow in order to appease people they consider to be crazies. We're not 
a bunch of anarchists trying to close down these marine parks. We, uh, my, our strategy really is to revolutionize them. There are many marine mammals that have uh, become victims to pollution and nets and so forth, and they, they become stranded. Well, we need to take them off the beach and take them to these places, rehabilitate them there, and let them go. That should be the show. That's the show. Not reducing them to performing circus clowns and selling this as education and research. In uh, January of 97, we got a call about a baby whale that was in distress in the Marina Channel, and we had very limited options on what we can do with this whale. Uh, SeaWorld at the time refused to send any help and said they wouldn't take her. Hundreds of people were lined up on these beaches looking at this whole event happening. And I think it was really the camera crews and the media attention that forced SeaWorld to say, well, if you guys could get her down here, we'll take her. I wanted to prove that if we can rescue this whale and we can rehab it, have SeaWorld rehab it, and send it back into the wild, that we wanted to prove that that's what the show should be. SeaWorld finally accepted the whale. Um, she beached herself right where the rescue trucks are, right where the camera crews are, right where the hundreds of people that were lined up on the beaches. And we were able to get the whale on the, the, the truck, transport her into the U-Haul truck, and drive her with police escort all the way to San Diego, and we got her there alive. SeaWorld, they got to hand it to them. They did a great job in the rehabilitation of this animal, proving that this is what they should do. It increased their attendance. Um, they didn't have to go out and capture a healthy animal to make the money they want to make. This is what the show should be. Right now, JJ is, is swimming out there somewhere free where she should be, and, and hopefully she's healthy. The captive dolphin and whale industry has been with us for over half a century, but the controversy surrounding its existence is a relatively new phenomenon. The issues are not likely to be resolved in the very near future, but the winds of change are blowing. Dr. Paul Spong. You have to realize that as we learn more about these animals, the whales and dolphins, the idea of keeping them confined in concrete tanks into the future makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. I think part of the answer has to be conduct some really well formulated experiments to see how possible it is to return the captives to life in the wild again. It's very difficult to get a dolphin to adjust to captivity. Taking them from their normal environment and putting them in a concrete box is very stressful for them. Reversing the process is not that difficult. Once you take them out of this concrete chlorinated box and put them into natural seawater, they heal themselves. They once again experience the natural rhythms of the sea and the tides and the currents. All of these things that we take for granted are very important to them. The death of killer whale trainer Don Branchow brought renewed arguments for releasing some of these animals back to the wild, citing the unprecedented effort in the late 1990s to send Keiko, star of the hit movie Free Willy, back to his home waters in Iceland. From a tiny, shallow pool at Reno Aventura Amusement Park in Mexico City. The initial idea was to improve Keiko's health and either send him to another marine park with other killer whales or, if not practical, return him to his Icelandic home waters. Park officials agreed. Earth Island co-director Dave Phillips led the newly founded Free Willy Keiko Foundation. Our agreement with the owner of Keiko was that we had to build a facility uh, and find a place where we could bring him, where he could be rescued, brought back to health, with a goal of reuniting him uh, into the wild in his home waters. You have to remember, Keiko was in really bad physical health at the time that we were getting ready and contemplating his future. He had papillomavirus, 
His weight was very low. He was in very warm water and very poor health. And our veterinarians told us that he probably could not survive more than about another three months. After four years of rehabilitation in Oregon and Iceland, Keiko was free to roam the North Atlantic with other wild killer whales. After he was in the sea pen and then the bay pen and then out swimming with wild whales, went a step further and he actually swam on his own more than a thousand miles and ended up in Norway. And during that time he was with wild whales for some period of the time and then, and then split from them and swam all the way across the ocean. When he arrived there he was in perfect shape, had been eating throughout this trip and, and arrived in, in robust condition. Throughout that period he was healthy and he was active and he would swim out into the wild in the native waters of, uh, of, of Norway. He died of pneumonia, which is not unusual for aging male orca whales. He died a natural death. His death from pneumonia in Norway brought renewed criticism from SeaWorld for what they claimed was a misguided effort that was doomed from the start. So you've got SeaWorld out there claiming, oh my God, Keiko died, how irresponsible of the Free Willy Keiko Foundation. Now, Keiko was offered to SeaWorld, he was offered to a number of captive facilities where they could have had him live out his life. And those people came down to Mexico, evaluated the situation, and basically threw up their hands and said they didn't want anything to do with it. They thought Keiko was going to die down there. They didn't want the Papilloma anywhere near their other whales. And so basically they left and said they wanted nothing to do with it. So at that point, uh, our agreement was we would do our best to create a situation which would be healthy for him and that we would give him a shot at being able to be returned to his native waters. What really sticks out to me is the hypocrisy of this because in that time frame, look what's happened at the captive orca whale scene at places like SeaWorld. Death after death, orca whale after orca whale dying, orca whales attacking trainers. Animals that are capable of being returned to the wild are retired, not happening. I mean, if you look at almost every other mammal in zoos and circuses, there are opportunities for retirement of these animals, for elephants, lions, is there been a single instance of a retirement of a performing orca whale? Even though many of them could be brought back to their native waters and put in sea pens or returned to the wild, it's never happened because they're just money machines and their whole attitude is towards perpetuating that, not about what's really good for orca whales. So they are the last people that ought to be saying word one about Keiko. Even if you accepted that it was all right to produce an entire population of orcas that were uh, maladjusted socially and did not get the proper training to be mothers and did not get the proper socialization to be proper orcas, period. Even if you accepted that there was just simply going to be a captive bred population that would never see the wild. I don't think they're ever going to be able to develop a self-sustaining captive breeding population where they'll never have to take another animal from the wild. And therefore, the captive population, let alone the captive breeding population, is always going to be much too small to sustain a genetic diversity that's required for a healthy population. They're always going to have to go back to the wild periodically and bring in fresh new blood. So their claims that their goal is to develop a self-sustaining breeding population is another sham. We should perhaps draw the conclusion by now that what we thought would be all right 30 years ago, we know better now, and it's not all right. And we don't need to continue to remove animals from the wild and put them into captivity to be ambassadors for the next human generation.
What many people don't seem to understand is that these animals are committed to these facilities for the rest of their life. There is no parole. They are in small facilities until they die. I can't imagine any of these animals, given the opportunity to go back to the wild, would reject it. One thing is for certain, as our knowledge, understanding, and appreciation for whales and dolphins continues to grow, so too will the scrutiny we focus on marine parks. It is clear that changes must take place and that facilities that hold these animals must be held accountable, not just to the government, which has all too often failed in its responsibilities, but to the people, without whose attendance these parks would cease to exist. But the speed at which these changes occur can be measured only by the level of understanding, concern, and compassion we feel for the well-being of these animals. Whales and dolphins do not exist merely for us to exploit or for our future generations to enjoy. They are intelligent, social, and sentient animals which need and enjoy each other's company and the environment that has been their home for millions of years. If taking them from the wild is what we decide to do, then there's little they can do to stop us. But if appreciation and compassion can be developed for them as wild, free creatures in a natural environment, whether through whale watching, books, or films, then captivity, by its very nature, must cease to exist. It's a choice we all have to make, for it is a choice they cannot make. Mm -hmm.